Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session at Open Source Strategy Forum, Bridging Modern DevOps in the Mainframe. And we have a great set of panelists here across the mainframe industry. Uh, we'll start, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is John Mertig. I'm director of the Open Mainframe Project. I work on behalf of the Linux Foundation across many of our projects here, um, really helping focus make the Open Mainframe Project and its communities successful in supporting the activities of the community. And we have three great panelists to join me here. Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, Len Santulucia, chairperson of the Open Mainframe Project and the CTO and business development manager for Viacom Infinity. Welcome, Len. Thank you, John. Appreciate the opportunity today to be on the panel. Definitely. We have Jen Francis, who is developer advocate for the IBM Open Group uh, and a master certified architect. Welcome, Jen. And we have Sam Knudsen from uh, the VP of Product Management from CompuWare, who is a BMC company. Welcome, Sam. Glad to be here, John. So let's dig right into it. Um, and the first topic to discuss here today is, you know, talking about how we got here. The Linux Foundation's Open Mainframe Project is five years old uh, this month, or not this month, I'm sorry, this year. And you know, a lot led up to that. Open source has really been a part of the mainframe for a long time now, um, really since the early days of the mainframe back in the 1950s. And the Zoe Initiative, the Zoe Project, launched two years ago in 2018. And so we're going to talk about a little today here with the panel. Maybe Len will start with you, as you were really along in the early days of the Open Mainframe Project and even beyond of Linux coming to the platform. What were some of the challenges and opportunities that really led to the creation of the Open Mainframe Project? Uh, thank you, John. Well, the Linux Foundation's timing of the Open Mainframe project was excellent. It was actually at the time uh, exactly when IBM announced the IBM Linux One system, if you might recall. It was up there and uh, it was an event in, in Seattle. And um, with the new Linux only uh, mainframe type system, plus Linux already having quite a footprint on uh, mainframes in general. Uh, the need for helping bring more focus on open source, uh, open source projects, open source software to the platform was just, at, uh, just right at the right time. Um, you know, a lot of times, people run into barriers of bringing that kind of, uh, those kinds of solutions based in and around open source. And with the um, experience of the Linux Foundation helping uh, form this project around the mainframe, and then uh, also with the uh, Zoe Initiative, which started a few years later, uh, one of the very first ZOS open source projects, open uh, projects. Um, it was uh, really needed because it helped bring good uh, semblance around the work that needed to be done with compliance and uh, project management and um, uh, bringing the different organizations uh, that wanted to participate and contribute to the project. It was just, uh, you, you just couldn't ask for a better thing to ha have happened. And now, today, there are uh, 15 established, strong, open mainframe project projects. I have to say that uh, fast three times, right, John? <laughs> and um, uh, all in uh, different stages. Uh, there's a, a lot of work that's going on, a lot of different people com uh, contributing uh, in organizations. Some are on multiple projects. And it has also helped with um, the internship program, uh, bringing some of those resources from some very bright students working on some of, the, some of them. And actually, some of those actually turned into actual uh, projects themselves, uh, one of these 15 that we just mentioned today. So uh, that's been kind of my perspective. And then, um, you know, 
I volunteered the first year and then I didn't realize it was going to turn into a career. <laughs> it's been great though. I really enjoy it. Uh, I can't believe five plus years have gone by already and uh, I don't see any end in sight. The, 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 the open source uh, projects and the open source coming to the mainframe is just uh, exponentially growing, John. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you've been a great asset, not only to the project, but just to the mainframe community um, as a whole. Um, you know, Jen, maybe just some of your thoughts. And I know you've been involved more in the project here recently. Um, you know, certainly as Zoe has really taken off, and I know you work with a lot of customers in the field. Tell me about some of what you've seen out there. Yeah, so I think Lynn started to really hit the nail on the head. So, you know, the whole life cycle of just Linux, looking at the operating system, and then when the Linux Foundation came um, about, it's always been the community involvement, community contribution, that open collaboration. When Open Mainframe started five years ago, it actually started to break down those barriers that we've always had around Z. It's always been, you know, what IBM's done, what the other uh, vendors have done that have built on top of IBM Z. And for the first time, we're actually saying, no, we really want to foster collaboration. And Zoe was really this like kind of really big effort between all of these big Z shops. And I say shops in the way of like, you know, um, Compuware and, and Broadcom and IBM and, and Rocket and all of these companies saying, we're actually going to work together on a project to make something that will actually open up how we can interact with the traditional side of IBM Z with ZOS. And that's been amazing to see that all come through, what we've been able to do with it, how we've been able to grow it, and really how it started all of these other projects um, that are really addressing what we all see and feel as we work with clients as, um, you know, maybe even as we work in our own uh, companies. So now we've got projects like um, the Open Mainframe uh, Education Project, where we're working to have collateral available um, that everybody can use to have a path to help people learn how to work with um, the ZOS side of the house. And, and having that be like a joint effort, it, it's, it shouldn't just be one company. I mean, this is technology we all love. Why not share that passion? So it's been really fun to see how that's grown and changed and all the different projects that have come about and really how it's going to change the future for the technology that we all love to use. Absolutely, absolutely. Looking always forward to the future. It's, it's really a cool thing. And, you know, Sam, I want to you know, talk to you here. I mean, Copyware and BNC, we're, we're part of the initial launch. And I know you've just been around the mainframe community for a long time. I mean, I think if, if anybody, you know, talks about people who've been stalwarts in the name green community, you know, Sam, your name is right there with all of them. Um, and I know you've been able to see this definitely from a broader perspective. Tell me, you know, a little bit about what you've seen as sort of the challenges, opportunities around open source in the mainframe and how you see, you know, open mainframe project, Zoe and some of those projects fitting in. So you're right. This has been really a long time theme on the mainframe, which is collaboration, and cooperation and sharing amongst customers. And you know, the share user group is, you know, if you think about where do the roots of some of these things that are today you know, mature in the, the open mainframe project, where do they go back to? And the share user group since the very early days of the, uh, the platform was customers coming together at first just a handful to support each other directly in ways that were complementary or sometimes filled in gaps from IBM as a platform provider. And so things like the Share Program Library Agency, the SLA tapes, you know, back when code was exchanged on listings or punch cards and eventually round tapes, uh, the evolution to private collaboration of customers through things like the CBT tape, which is kind of a collection of collections uh, which was named from the Connecticut Bank and Trust, where one of the chief curators, you know, Arnie Casagino, worked. And now Sam Golub and I continue to carry that on. And most recently, really coming into the Open Mainframe project and getting support in continuing to foster those efforts. So it, it is a community that spans more than five decades and has evolved. And so the, it's just natural now that comes into a framework where there's you know, more formalized support, there's some ideas that will help it to evolve in terms of modern open source practices and governance. And all of those things are just natural changes over time. But, but the spirit that goes back to the launch of the mainframe is unchanged. And that is 
Customers want to help each other on this platform. People want to share knowledge and they want to share code that will help other people accomplish the same goals. They want to help raise the platform up and make it the best experience for everybody. You know, there's a, there's a column that I read years ago and it talked about, you know, we are all smarter together and solving other people's problems. And there, there is tremendous satisfaction in that, but there's also, uh, it's a little bit of, you know, ideal self-interest in that you help other people solve their problems, but you're helping them. So you see it in community forums, sharing code, and open source is today's incarnation of that effort. And I'm sure if you looked out 10 years in the future, 20 years in the future, it'll look a little different than today. But I do think this idea of open collaboration is here to stay. And the open mainframe project is, is a perfect example of how that's working in the mainframe community. Awesome. And you know, and, and Sam, I always, I, I think ever to look forward, you always have to look backwards. And you know, when we talk about open source, we exactly, we point right back to share 1955. Um, and that initial collaboration that came together and, you know, work that came from the CBT tape forming in 1975 of just bringing all of those, you know, all of that initial code that, you know, we would think is code, I guess, but, you know, it's, it's people exchanging ideas and things and bringing it forward. Um, I even learned recently that Jim Zemlin, um, his grandpa was involved in the mainframe and uh, he always used to joke with them and say, you know, every new technology Jim would talk to him about, he's like, well, the mainframers did that decades ago, and open source is one of them for sure. Um, but on top of that, he said he actually attended Share um, as a kid. So it's so interesting to see all of that just come completely full circle. You actually see generational involvement in the community, you know, where, you know, parents, children who are now in their 20s are entering into similar careers on the same platform. And that, that's pretty amazing. But if you think about the contributions, it's thousands of individuals. And, and that is a, you know, an actual number that you know, I looked at it. It's more than a couple of thousand people, thousands of companies. So over, over this span of time, it is phenomenal the number of people who've had their hands uplifting the platform together. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's, let's jump forward to the next question here for this group. And, you know, Len touched on it. Zoe is that first open source project that's really based on the ZOS, um, you know, platform itself. And, you know, the concept of why it came together was to help create that integration plat platform for the next generation of tools uh, that need to support ZOS and really help bring together that entire uh, ecosystem ecosystem, but really bring it together even within the organization. And I know, Jen, you're, like I said, you're really customer facing, you're talking with developers, you're talking with people, you know, tell us a little bit like how you have seen this sort of play out. Um, so initially, Zoe was this like kind of like big bombshell kind of news. Like everyone's like, what is this? What is this? Um, and really now it's been like, okay, what are we going to do with this? How can we leverage this? How can we build on this? Um, Pretty much every customer I talk to, every organization I go to, everybody's looking to standardize their set of tooling that they use, particularly for DevOps. You know, we don't want to have to have an IDE for, you know, ZOS and a different IDE for power and a different IDE for our cloud systems and a different IDE for any like x86-based systems. We want to have a set of tooling. If you need to switch views or something like that, okay, that's fine. But we don't want to have to have our developers all the time trying to install different bases. So Zoe's really actually kind of kind of struck a chord with the audiences because it has a plugin, it has a CLI. We don't have to go to developers to say, hey, I really need you to use this other tool to work with this other system over here and make it feel weird and different. They can use tooling they already have like VS Code or maybe they don't use VS Code. Maybe they like using a text editor and they like to use CLIs. They can do that too. Um, but more than that, other people can build on top of that because it is an open source project. So it allows all of us to collaborate together to actually have what we need and what we need to use. And so the adoption of it's really been um, amazing. Everybody's wanting to try it. Everybody's experimenting with it. Everybody's really trying to figure out how it works best for their environment. Um, and then from that, trying to figure out, you know, could I build an extension on this? Maybe I need a different plugin and, you know, what do I need to do? So it, it's just been amazing to see how everybody's been so excited about this and really trying to uh, drive how they can standardize and use this across all of their systems. I 
Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a really great insight, and it's it's great to hear that from the field. And and I know Len um, at Viacom Infinity, uh, you all have really used this as an opportunity to do some really unique things in the space. Um, and I know one of um, you know yearly developers, Alex Kim, built a really interesting integration. Um, tell us about that, and just sort of tell us about um, how you're seeing this as you talk with customers. Sure, John. Um, the project that uh, John just mentioned here at Viacom Infinity is something called Viva, Viacom Infinity Voice Assistant. And it is based on Zoe. And all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, Alexa Echo and Google Home consumer level types of voice assistants that you use in and around the house to play music, to order something, to do whatever that you do at the consumer level. But the, the issue that we started uh, when we started thinking about a voice assistant to use them would, at an enterprise system level, would have introduced some very serious security uh, issues for enterprise type customers. So uh, Alex and his team set out to develop Viva and base it uh, on the interfaces within Zoe and then uh, take advantage of the technology for security in the mainframe area known as Hyper Protect Services, uh, which means that uh, 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 there's no way to be able to penetrate and look at the data, listen to other people's voice messages that might be being used over, this, over the Viva device or anything like that to net it out. And um, when we talked to people about this, they looked at it in kind of a funny way because uh, they say, wow, that means I don't have to use a keyboard anymore. Well, that's true. The world is starting to go more towards voice activation for everything. We know that all started with uh, Star Trek and uh, uh, Space Odyssey uh, 2001 uh, movies, right? So now being able to talk to the mainframe helps uh, with this device is being so secure, uh, makes it capable for uh, any kind of uh, enterprise level systems uh, people want to use it with because they don't have to worry about security and compliance issues. And uh, secondly, um, if you're worried about skills with the mainframe, well, if you can't talk the English language, I'm afraid we can't help you. <laughs> Viva allows you to use English language, uh, and talk to your system, command it, and management, uh, manage it uh, uh, just with your voice. And what more can you ask for today? Um, we are just beginning to roll it out and uh, get it into uh, some particular clients to help fine tune the project and uh, watch this space in 2021, which is can't get here fast enough for a lot of us, but it's gonna be here soon enough. So that's a little bit about that story, John. So Liz, that's a great could, you, could you ask Viva something like, how is job ABC doing? What, you know, what's its status or what's its output? Yes, Jen, exactly. Uh, what's my process utilization? Um, uh, how am I doing against my four hour rolling average of my, for my software costs? And the reason why we did this uh, uh, kind of as a starting point, you know, we work a lot with the financial services clients in and around the streets near our office. We're, uh, you know, Penn Plaza near Madison Square Garden. So, you know, there's a lot of financial services customers in and around us. And I grew up in that space on Wall Street for when I was still at IBM and still doing it here. And, uh, you know, when the market goes crazy, everybody gets very concerned on their SLAs. Am I meeting my SLAs? Uh, and how many times do they have to interrupt their 
system programmers to do that kind of work when they're busy doing everything else, uh, trying to keep the system up and running and uh, their, their day jobs, uh, afternoon jobs and evening jobs, right? So being able to do this, uh, put something like this uh, on your uh, phones, on, on your desk and be able to ask those kinds of questions without having to interrupt, is this going to make a big difference for productivity uh, and safety of accessing that data and, and those kinds of uh, pieces of information someone would be looking for, especially during crucial times. That's so cool. And there's a great video um, on the Open Mainframe Project YouTube of, of demos of that. You should really go check that out. Um, just to just kind of see it in action. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, you know, Sam, maybe a, a quick to you here. You know, I know you've been, like I said, around this platform a long time. CompuWare and BMC are huge leaders in the DevOps space and thinking about how to connect the administration management of ZOS systems back to the, you know, back into the, the rest of their environment. Um, you know, how are you seeing a technology like this potentially being able to, you know, really modernize the mainframe? So, I mean, something that CompuWare has really focused on since 2016 is evolving the developer experience. And, you know, our entire thesis has been that we wanted to mainstream the mainframe to make it different only in syntax. So there isn't anything that's, you know, inherently difficult about COBOL syntax versus Perl or, you know, Rust or Go or JCL versus Bash or TCL. So syntax can be learned. You know, programming is generally kind of a one, two, three, many exercise. And what we found is by bringing modern tools and by bringing open APIs to this space, this was an opportunity to really help mainframe development change to facilitate continuous delivery. And that the sort of the order of the day would be developer experiences that were modern and that were continuous delivery tool chains that were enabled by open APIs, you know, typically RESTful APIs that could plug into modern, you know, CI tools and ultimately to modern deployment tools. And that's definitely been our experience working with early adopters. We think that that type of approach is now moving to an early majority phase where more and more customers are looking to do this. And naturally it's going to be multi-platform, multi-vendor as they, they knit their own tool chains together. So things like the API, API gateway and Zoe, you know, offer a lot of interesting possibility. And Zoe is definitely at that wonderful stage. It's like the, the gangly teenager and you're thinking maybe it's gonna get its first job soon and, you know, will evolve. It has, it has a lot of potential. So I'm very excited as the, as, you know, as Zoe fosters some of this development and you see some, some key steps forward, like the delivery of, you know, sort of a gold standard binary and long-term support. So I think these things are incredibly important. And in, in terms of the long-term maturity, definitely it's early days for Zoe. And I think in the next couple of years, we'll start to see some very interesting things as customers figure out, how does this fit into my overall development process? And on the operational side, We've got technologies like Ansible that may become more relevant again, very early days, and vendors to this, you know, to this puzzle. And it's always going to be a combination of the community, the platform provider, IBM, and vendors, really all bringing innovation and you know to the platform and applying it to running the platform, keeping the lights on, as well as innovating the way that these processes are done. And vendors, especially BMC, have done an outstanding job of taking their, their investment in operational excellence and now incorporating modern, modern user interface design and AI and machine learning. So all of this is coming together in a very interesting time for the platform. And I'm, I'm really excited to see sort of where will Zoe be a year, two, five years down the road. And I think it will be one of those things that help all three of those groups come together to really continue to reinvent the platform. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. And, it, and, it's, and it's great, you know, as CompuWare uh, and now as a part of BMC has really been a leader in that space in the mainframe community um, and just understanding how to bring, you know, all of IT together. Because for so long, 
you know, the mainframe part of IT had been separated from the rest of the, uh, the IT infrastructure, the IT organization. And now as that's coming together, that API first um, mentality is, is really a key one, which is a great segue to what I want to start you right off with, Sam, because you talked about APIs and you talked about API first on the mainframe. What is it like? Like, what are you seeing um, interesting happening in that space? Principally that the people who do this work, when I talk about the developer experience evolution, the, the people who are sponsoring it are not typically mainframe, you know, long tenured majors. These are people who drive digital transformation, enterprise DevOps, and they look at the mainframe as just another platform. And so they really want to drive out some of the esoterica around it. They look for APIs that can be leveraged that are standard RESTful APIs that are documented in Swagger, for instance. And things like the APA gateway as a way to bring those things together are, you know, again, have tremendous potential. And so that's, that's where you really see this is the idea of being able to take tools, knit them together in, you know, in pipelines to build automation in ways that is absolutely compatible with what's already being done on other platforms is complementary to the, the automation and investments that are unique to the ZOS platform. And those will always exist. You know, I, I would, if you want to talk about macro trends, things like Ansible will never completely supplement the automation that's built on platform. You know, the on platform management engines and monitors. What's happening is those monitors, for instance, if you think of sort of classic tools, are being modernized. You know, uh, BMC talks about this in terms of Amy bringing, you know, a modern set of tenants and techno you know, technology attributes to tools that have often existed for a long time. And again, kind of reinventing them in this modern context. So that's where I see customers going is looking at their existing investment and their applications on the mainframe, working code, working code is gold. So you don't want to throw that away. You know, you can't go buy the application that you have evolved over 40 years to meet compliance needs and line of business needs because those applications don't exist in a catalog of packaged applications you could buy on the cloud, even if you could get the same class of service from the mainframe. But what they want to do is say, how do I reinvent the way that I'm updating these applications to work in to work in a new way to bring you know agile techniques and DevOps methods to the fore with my engineers and then give them different ways to do that work so that they're they're taking all of these things that we've learned on other platforms and applying them to the mainframe. Mainframe is going to be around for another 50 years, absolutely, but it will be it'll continue to be reinvented. And as vendors in a community, we're going to embrace that in new ways. And, you know, APIs is, is a good example of that. More and more capabilities, it's important that they're exposed through APIs in, in many ways more so than what you are directly exposing to users through a user interface, because you can't possibly anticipate all of the user's needs. And you, you'll, you'll continue to see, I think, from BMC, you know, and CompuWare, uh, robust investment, but all of the other vend vendors who are looking at this platform as a long-term, you know, place where their customers are going to be. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I know, Jen, maybe to you here as, you know, when I talk APIs and um, the API first mentality, a developer advocate where those all just connect right together. Tell me what you're seeing. Yeah, so APIs definitely are, are the, the latest trend, buzz, um, whatever you want for how you're going to integrate. And if I look back at what's happened with ZOS, so when ZOS Connect came out from IBM, it was so much excitement because you can make REST calls into Kix and DB2 and IMS and all these traditional systems. And oh my gosh, we don't have to change our code. We can just basically make them like REST enabled. Um, and also that opened up so many doors. But if you've been watching since then, we've actually enabled more ways to use APIs with Z. So it's always a great example. Um, you can manage your system uh, through APIs 
But if you also watch what some of the other teams that are doing across companies that work on ZOS, so like I'm going to pick on Kix. I'm here in Hersley. Um, I get to hear a lot from the Kix team. They released um, the ability to use GraphQL with their Kix Explorer. So you can actually manage your Kix plexes and see what's going on with them through GraphQL, which is another API that's, you know, it's open source technology that now you can use to manage Kix. That's just one example because API first is the way going forward. It is an easier way to, to manage your system. It is an easier way to integrate your systems. Um, so if you're not looking for the ways to exploit your technology using APIs, you're going to start missing the boat um, because it just allows so many different things to connect. And, and, Jen, you remember, and Jen, you remember when you asked me the questions uh, that uh, uh, Viva could answer. Well, we're going through the RESTful APIs and um, also ZOSMF and all those things. So uh, it's taking advantage of all, you know, the labs that are building this, this API first technology. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and Len, I would imagine, you know, you're working with the leading financial institutions, um, you know, in our country and in our world. I would imagine they're thinking the same thing as this API first mentality as well. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they are. Very much so. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll wrap up on one last question and I'm asking you all to look forward, look into the future, DevOps in the mainframe. Um, and Sam, maybe we'll start with you on this one and Len and Jen, you know, tell us what you're thinking. What does the future of DevOps in the mainframe look like in your world? I think it, it is the, just the normal way that people operate. I think if you were to look forward, say, you know, even five or 10 years, the way that people manage their mainframes will have been transformed, you know, and it, it will naturally evolve into a platform that is tightly knit into the practices that are used for both operation in, you know, in terms uh, and development of all the other platforms that are predominant. And, you know, mainframe and cloud really are incredibly complementary. So today, you know, there are very few true commodity applications that make, you know, that are on a mainframe. As I, you know, I think I mentioned before, you think about two platform IT as the strategy that CompuWare has long pursued. Yeah, I'm not going to run email on my mainframe, but what I am going to continue to run for the next 50 years are applications that have unique compliance, scalability, security, and auditability requirements. And those applications will be developed using continuous delivery practices and a developer experience that is equal to any other platform so that our developers on the mainframe are excited that they can enter the platform without years and years of specialized training or apprenticeship because skills is one of the biggest issues that customers talk about. But you don't, you don't just fix skills with one thing. There's no silver bullet. So it takes investment in terms of hiring and mentoring and culture to really attract people to work on the platform. And it also takes a great developer experience. And you know, that's certainly something CompuWare is going to focus on every day. I have people who get out of bed and just obsess about that every day to make sure that we can make happier developers. And everything that we've talked about is part and parcel to that. So you're going to see continued evolution of commercial tools that plug into both, you know, open source technologies. So things, you know, if you think about CI tools like Jenkins, which is a, it's both an open source project and a commercial offering. I think that's one of the trends that will bubble up as you continue to see that open source mentality applied to some of the mainframe technologies but it's absolutely going to be a very different world. You will see operations that is supported by assistive technology, machine learning, and AI ops. And this is where, you know, BMC is going into the future. We, you know, they have a, an amazing vision for enterprise DevOps on the development side and these application of technologies that really help people to proactively manage their mainframes in ways that, are almost hard to imagine now because we're really kind of in many ways still flying biplanes and pretty pretty soon you know when soon is five years you know in you know, beginning right now we're going to have mainframe installations that are managed 
you know, by systems that are the equivalent of autopilots in our, our latest airliners that can actually do incredibly complex tasks, not just sort of keep things on the level, but actually take off and land an automation that anticipates problems and prevents them from happening. People have that in a vision now, but it's only just starting to be realized. So all of that is gonna require that customers invest in an API strategy, that they really look at developers as high performance athletes that can be encouraged and, and draw and help them to be successful. So they'll implement practices like automation to support those development activities, integrated sets of third party tools and measurement to really help their, their developers be amazing contributors to those applications that run on the mainframe platform because it's the only platform that can host those applications and meet all their requirements. It's, it's, a, it's a great excited. look at the future there, definitely. A definitely exciting look at the future there. Uh, Len, uh, Jen, what would you want to add to that? Uh, Jen, I uh, want me to go? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of look at it um, in a perspective of um, family. As you can imagine with a last name like mine, Italian families are a very important thing. And the best way to get collaboration and cooperation is treating someone like family. The mainframe and all the other alternative platforms that are within organizations, if they start treating each other like family, all become part of DevOps, all become part of CI, CD, watch things happen in a very positive way. And uh, it will be for the betterment of the mainframe and the betterment of the other platforms that sometimes try to ignore the mainframe or pretend it doesn't exist or don't want anything to do with it, whatever you want to say. And once this is all united, following the policies of DevOps, CI, CD, the future of the mainframe will be as bright as that sun that we see on this slide. It's a very, very, very bright future when, when all of this finally comes together. Jen, how about you? Yeah, I love the analogy of family there. Um, I think it is exactly that. And I think particularly collaborating more in the open source forum is really enabling that. Um, as we continue to move forward and look to the future, as everybody is collaborating together, all the different languages, all the different tools, they are just that, they're just tools because we now can have you know standard interfaces through things like APIs or even CLIs. Um, we can pick and choose and have a standard kind of tool set to create whatever we need. So we're not kind of putting the mainframe over here in its little box in the corner anymore. We're saying it is one of the platforms you can use the tools that you're using across all the other ones, you can actually start to use those or you are already using those with your mainframe. And that will just continue to evolve through all of this collaboration. Um, it becomes a matter of, you know, my mom and I, we both love to cook, but if you give us the same recipe, we're gonna go about it differently. She's gonna have her preferred methods. I'm gonna have mine. But at the end of the day, we end up with the exact same thing. And that's what it's really all about. So if we can collaborate to find the best of those methodologies, um, that's what all of this is about. So we have the best of both worlds and we can have the best solution in the end and build on all those years of experience. So like all the experience my mom has with making the absolutely perfect pie crust, I'm still perfecting mine. She's got it down. I'm gonna pick up some of her techniques and I'm gonna add in some of my new ones. And that's exactly what we're doing with all this collaboration and what we're seeing with DevOps to really have the best possible uh, platform in the future. Jen, you ought to, uh, to ask my aunts and grandparents uh, uh, about recipes. Oh, it's a little bit of this, uh, a little bit of this, a, a pinch of that. Ma, yep. what are you talking about? I'm trying to, tell me how much, a cup is a teaspoon, what is it? <laughs> I don't know, exactly. I think, I think you all have got me hungry here, so maybe we need to wrap this up. Uh, I want to thank all of you. This has been a great panel. I really appreciate all everyone's time and the different perspectives. Um, 
to learn more about the Open Mainframe Project, go to openmainframeproject.org. You can learn about any of our 16 hosted projects and working groups on the projects page, openmainframeproject.org slash projects. And if you're looking to get involved, if you're an organization in this space and um, really see stewardship in the future of the mainframe important to you, uh, I encourage you looking at membership opportunities and you can learn about um, members and and how to become a part of it. And I just want to thank everyone. This has been a great panel. I hope everyone here enjoys the rest of Open Source Strategy Forum and has a great day. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank you.